Hello, and welcome to the sixth episode of The Sulfuric Secrets, a horror podcast from between two worlds. The Sulfuric Secrets is told over different time periods and locations as part of an overarching narrative. Last time we saw one Mr. Jack Olson. He was in southern Florida, 100 meters below the surface of the water at Pisces Reef Base, experiencing a terrifying ecological event as the small base tips on the edge of a gaping 1.5 kilometer moor. Don't worry, Jack is okay, but he's got a lot of questions for Desmond Lynch. Episode 6 of The Sulfuric Secrets is called Mariana's Trench. Please be advised that this episode contains mature content that might not be appropriate for all audiences. Jack Olson recomposed himself. The last few hundred birds sunk out of sight into the dark mass in front of him. He wiped the sweat from his brow, his arms, his chest. When Jack got a chance, he told Desmond Lynch about what happened. Desmond seemed unsurprised and explained that earthquakes can sometimes have very severe effects on local birds. Their magnetic alignment gets thrown off, leading to a very tragic but very common disaster. Jack wasn't stupid. Florida is nowhere near any tectonic plate boundaries. There had been four recorded instances of earthquakes in the past few hundred years. 1565, 1879, 1886, and 1893. Out of all four of those, the most powerful one caused some church bells to ring by themselves. The only event approaching any sort of danger was in nearby Cuba. A couple of people died in an 1880 earthquake, but that was because of the building's design. Jack knew Desmond was full of shit. Did Desmond know that Jack knew? Who knows? But Jack knew that he'd be a fool to try to push him for further information. The following months went fine. By May 1946, Jack was able to do a couple of expeditions in his newly designed submersible. It was able to reach the bottom of the Florida continental shelf. The first time Jack went down to the ocean floor, he didn't want to admit how terrified he was. There had been no explanation for what had happened a few months ago on March 20 and he had a sneaking suspicion that whatever it was that had caused the disturbance was probably something on the ocean floor. After a successful first expedition, Jack completed four more, with decreasing trepidation each time. Jack was happy that he could at least control one thing. No one on the team, not even Desmond Lynch, was allowed to call his submersible a bathysphere. There was one final time that Jack sought to enter into a conversation of any sort of significance with Desmond Lynch. Jack was certainly not the type to seek approval from others, but this was different. The past three months had been a very delicate, careful balance on behalf of Jack. Jack had engaged his teammates in conversation without asking any questions about the project or their personal or professional lives. But on his final night at the Pisces Reef base, he took Desmond Lynch aside and he asked him 
if he had considered the three-month expedition a success. Considering that Jack had absolutely nothing to benchmark success, or even the goals of the project against. Desmond Lynch responded that he would put that information in the project's final report. Jack thought for a second. That's as clear as possible that Lynch wasn't in the mood to discuss the particulars, even on the final day. But then Jack thought, final day. This would be his last chance to ever discuss the project before the dive, so why not take a risk? Jack coughed, (coughs) looked Desmond Lynch in the eye, and asked him when he would get to see that report. There was nothing hostile or even unfriendly about the way that Lynch responded, which only confused Jack even more. Desmond Lynch looked Jack right back in the eye, almost with a warm smile, and said in complete earnestness, Likely never. Lynch nodded at Jack, and walked to the front of the base to get into his scuba gear. Jack laughed to himself slightly, shaking his head. United States, Navy Oceanographic Research Department, aka US Nord, Project Report APO 108. August 16th, 1946. Report Author, Vice Admiral Desmond Lynch. Preface. This report outlines oceanographic aspects of the project which are the research efforts of the United States Navy Oceanographic Research Department, hereby referred to as U.S. Nord, in a joint project with the University of to traverse and document Ocean Zone Z-49, also commonly known as the Marianas Trench. Logistics. U.S. Nord employed the services of Dr. Jack Olson, a graduate of mechanical engineering and world's leading authority in high-pressure silicone glass to lead the Kemp Project's expedition to the ocean floor. And to build a version of the bathysphere able to withstand the extreme pressures of 36,000 feet, or 11 kilometers, in metric measurement. Personal note. Dr. Olson showed an exemplary disposition suited to the project. A natural scientific curiosity mixed with a tendency towards discretion when discussing detail. The dive. Dr. Jack Olson spent three months in training in Florida, with the majority of his training at the full 100 meters below the surface of the water. Although it would be impossible to acclimatize him to the pressure, this was deemed adequate to acclimatize him to spending extended durations underwater. On June 19th, Dr. Olson was flown to the APRA Harbor Naval Base in Guam. Due to the secrecy of the project, suitable measures were taken to disguise the nature of the exercise. The project had secured the Al Tucker, an unregistered Otori-class torpedo boat, as part of Japan's surrender agreement after the war. At nightfall, the Al Tucker was launched with a skeleton crew north-northeast, 550 clicks passing the northern Mariana islands of Songsong, Tinian, and Saragan before briefly stopping at Pagan. The Autaka then headed 350 clicks due west. The vessel arrived at its drop-off point at daylight on June 20th, 1946. The Autaka dropped Dr. Olsen's submersible into the water, with Dr. Olsen as the pilot of the submersible. The underwater vehicle successfully extended the full 11 kilometers of cabling within a couple of hours. Following this, no activity was recorded for the next six hours. Following 18 hours from the point of detachment, the Autaka retrieved the cable for the submersible, but found that the line was no longer attached to the underwater vehicle. After some deliberation, the crew of the Autaka returned home back to the Guam Apra Harbor base.
US Nord would like to thank Dr. Olsen for his service to the country. Margaret stood in front of the crowd, in silence. She hadn't prepared a speech. This wasn't her first funeral, and it wasn't the first time that she hadn't prepared a speech for one either. But this time she had a very good reason. As Jack departed, little Charlie had arrived. Margaret didn't respect funerals. They didn't make sense to her. Funerals reminded her of the snake oil salesman of the Old West that her grandpa told her about. But on top of that, this funeral in particular was getting on her nerves. Particularly with no body to bury. Margaret? M Mrs. Olsen? It felt like the entire church's gaze was burning into Margaret. The priest called out Margaret's name again. Margaret looked around the room. Not a single familiar face. Margaret was a woman of secrets and was content to play Jack's fantasy of the thick-skinned Southern Belle. And he never seemed to find a reason to ask about why Margaret didn't seem to have any friends or family of her own. In the corner... She spotted the same group of men that she saw on her way in, who were from the armed forces. It was an odd combination. Air Force, Marines, Navy, Army, all glittering with badges indicating their rank. And one member, from a chaplain corps, wearing a badge for a religion that even Margaret couldn't recognise. Who were the Atlantic Telegraph Company? They'd given Margaret a large compensation package for Jack's death. A little too large. Then, Margaret felt a sharp emptiness in her stomach, as if she were pushed from a height. She had been receiving an unusual amount of house calls since Jack's death, which seemed normal in the circumstances. An exterminator, an electrician, a repossessor. So... Why were they sitting in the fourth and sixth rows? Okay, just calm down, Maggie, she thought. Let's think this through. Let's be rational. Give the speech. Pick up Charlie. Get the first boat out of the country. Maggie stumbled through her eulogy for Jack. Just play the role, she thought. Too choked up to continue. Walk off. Play the role. She's overcome with emotion, they'll say. There will be a key half second where they will give her the benefit of the doubt. And she'll use that half second to slip out before they become wise. Don't look, don't look, Margaret thought as she came off the podium. Margaret had made it past the final row of pews and opened the doors leading to the freedom outside. Standing in front of her was a thick, large man, stout like a warthog, wearing a beige suit. Margaret didn't have anyone, and hadn't had the opportunity to truly mourn Jack. 
So when the man put his hand on her shoulder and offered his sincere condolences, Margaret nearly burst. The man sensed it and began walking away with her, away from the church, from where people could see. No, I've got to go. I've got a boat to catch, Margaret said. The man nodded in understanding, hugging her with one arm as he continued to lead her outside. Margaret desperately wanted to nuzzle her head into his chest and just take the slightest moment to break into a million pieces. Margaret pulled her head away from the beige fabric in front of her face. She didn't even realise, but there were tears and snot on his suit. The man didn't even seem to mind. Margaret saw that she was standing in front of a black, unregistered vehicle. The large, kind man told Margaret that he could just drop her off. Margaret recomposed herself and told the man that she could just walk. Firmly, this time. It was at this moment that Margaret realised just how much her emotions had betrayed her. They had walked a long distance from the church. And now, with the large man flanking her in front and the car behind her, she couldn't help but feel like an animal cornered. But it was the next thing that Vice Admiral Desmond Lynch said that made Margaret's blood run cold. What? Walk. All the way to 921 East 221st Street, Williamsbridge. Are you sure little Charlie will be there when you get back? The second time Vice Admiral Lynch offered Margaret a ride, she hopped in without saying a word. You've just listened to episode 6 of The Sulfuric Secrets. I'll be sad to see Jack Olsen go, but I know he's gone to a better place. Or maybe he hasn't. If you liked this episode, be sure to support the project through the Between Two Worlds Patreon. This is a real passion project and all amounts help. Make sure to comment on, like, and recommend The Sulfuric Secrets to people who might like it. I'd love to hear your feedback on the project and any theories you might have. Finally, be sure to visit the YouTube page as the video version of The Sulfuric Secrets is posted on Wednesdays. Here you'll find an edited video version that hopefully helps to build a richer visual world. Until then, thank you and good night.